My friend Vess, who works at Unity, a few weeks ago he went to this game jam and he made some rules for himself. He said, I'm not going to do any custom modeling and I'm not going to do any custom texturing and I just want to see how far I can get. So he went to the asset store and got a whole bunch of assets from the asset store just to see if he could turn that into something pretty. And he does this because he really cares a lot about the process of creative prototyping about making sure that very early in your project, you have the project in a state where you can already see and feel what the project wants to be. Where you can say things like, well, I don't think that direction is really going to work very well. Let's try it a bit more like that. Because only in that phase of the project, you'll get a much better idea of which assets really don't matter so much and which assets are really going to set your project apart and you want to spend your energy on. Please welcome Lucas Meyer. <laughs> hey, everybody. Let's have some fun. <laughs> I'm going to show you a scene today. I'm going to show you how a scene was made. And when I first saw this scene, I didn't really believe it was put together in a few days. Let's take a look. I have it open here on my, uh, in my Unity editor, in my scene view. And the first thing that you will see is that I have a whole bunch of buildings sort of propped out in my scene view. These are all from the sci-fi buildings pack on the asset store. They're just sort of, you know, sprinkled around in the scene a little bit. If I zoom in a bit more, you can see that quite a bit of the scene is actually mapped out with Unity cubes. This is cube 24, the cubes we all uh, know and love. If I zoom in a bit more, if I can do that with my shaking hands, we enter this street here where a lot of things are going on. Let's take a look. Now, this is pretty much what I would expect the scene to look like if you were to grab all sorts of stock assets from a store or from, uh, from wherever and put them together in a scene. Assets that weren't necessarily made to look good together. Some of them may be not even made to look good at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, they're pretty good. <laughs> For instance, uh, you know, if we look around the scene here, this thing over here, what, like, <laughs> like, what is this even? This is like props for naval beacon. It's a naval beacon here just sitting in the middle of the street. Makes no sense. At least they put like a little fence around it. Look at that. <laughs> This scene, it will lean very heavily on the post-processing stack and volumetric fog to go from this image to an image that I think looks pretty nice. Um, let's start off by taking a nice camera angle here to enable some of these post-processing stack effects. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enable lighting in my scene view. That's already going to be quite a big difference. Look at that. So that gives us normal direct lighting, and a little bit of a light map. The first effect I'm going to turn on is ambient occlusion. It gives these really sort of soft contact shadows. Let me turn it on and off a few times for you so you can see. Oh, actually, let me turn on this thing here so we can actually see. There we go. It gives these really sort of soft, depthy feel to the scene. The next effect that I'm going to turn on is screen space reflections. If you look closely at these puddles at the bottom of the, of the floor, I guess the floor only has a bottom, but you'll <laughs> have to forgive me for that. I'll turn it on and off. And you can really see that in these puddles, these yellow canisters, or what, like whatever they are, get reflected, and it looks kind of nice. I'm also going to turn on my camera distortion. And I'm going to turn on depth of field and motion blur, which you don't really see right now, but later on when the camera will start moving, they'll become more apparent. The biggest effect that this scene relies on is volumetric fog from the volumetric lighting pack. Let me turn that on. Like, whoa. It's an, it has an enormous effect on the scene. In fact, it's so big that I'm immediately going to tone it down a little bit by applying my color grading and my auto exposure. Let's take a look at this volumetric fog. I have a multiplier here. 
and I can crank it all the way up so you can really see the effect it has on the scene, but I could also tone it all the way down. And when I tone it all the way down, you can see that there's almost nothing left in the scene. That's because this scene, it's lit by these area lights, but it's not so much the direct lights of these area lights that make the scene come together, it's the fact that these lights shine onto the fog, and then it's the fog that what, uh, that's what you see. So when I take out the fog, there's almost nothing left. Let me bring that guy back up. Let's take a look at this color grading thing that I just quickly enabled. I'm going to turn that on and off a few times for you as well. Look at that. Color grading in post processing is such a big part these days of achieving this final look for your game or for your movie or for whatever, for whatever it is that you're making. Some people you know, spend their whole careers learning how to properly color grade. And Unity, it brings these movie industry color grading tools in the hands of game developers everywhere. I have these three color wheels over here. I mean, it has zillions of buttons that I don't really understand, but this left one here, <laughs> they control my shadows. So maybe if I want to have like a little bit more bluish shadows, I can drag that to the bottom like that. And the right one over here is my highlights. So if I want to have a little bit more warm highlights, maybe I just drag that a little bit more to the red or yellow like that. Check that out. It's amazing, it's just so much fun to just play around with, and it's an essential part these days of really getting the final look of your game right. Let me move that back so that Vess, who made this scene, doesn't yell at me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna add one more effect. I'm gonna add the bloom that really makes these neon signs pop out. And then I'm gonna add a few small ones, a little bit of aberration, a little bit of vignette some grain, and since it's uh, raining cats and dogs here in Austin, why not uh, <coughs> apply that to the scene as well? Notice actually that I'm doing all these image effects in the scene view. All these image effects, they run in the scene view these days, and that's super important, because the scene view is where you work. If you want to decide whether or not you want to move your naval beacon a bit more to the left or to the right, it's really nice to be able to do that and see what it ends up looking at without having to switch to the game view. It's also probably even more important just because it's the thing you look at all day. So, you know, we're in games, we make pretty things. Why, you know, if it's possible to look at something pretty all day versus something not pretty, like, why not do that? So they run in the scene view. And I think this is a pretty good time to see what this scene is going to look like if we add a little bit of animation. What we're doing here is we're using timeline to animate this camera. We're also using timeline to animate these characters. And also these little friendly neighborhood drones that are flying around. You can see this little toy car in the bottom that gets in focus and out of focus. That's because Timeline also animates the focus length of the depth of field. And it gets this really nice sort of cyberpunky, gloomy, I really like the steam over here kind of feel to the scene. There's a few more things in this scene that I'd like to uh, highlight. Let me pause this for a little bit and free this camera from the timeline, like this, so that I can fly around a little bit. There's a few shots that I want to show you. Whoa! <laughs> um, like here, you have all these pipes, you have steam coming out. Notice that when I focus on the spaceship here, don't worry, there's just a spaceship here, um, it, becomes, uh, it becomes in focus, and when I look away, the depth of field focuses somewhere else. You have all these pipe systems here that lead to these sort of sewer pipe things. And I was wondering, has anyone seen these before, these sewer pipes? Maybe in a different game? Or maybe like, um, maybe like 30 seconds ago when I was over here? Look at that. It's just this sci-fi building. And this scene is full of tricks like that. We just took this sci-fi building, we squashed it, 
put it on his side, slapped it on the wall, made it sort of attached to these pipes, eh, kind of worked. And the scene is full of stuff like that. Here's one I really like. Notice this, uh, you have these really pretty area lights. But notice this sort of like darkish sci-fi ceiling with all these wires hanging from the bottom. That's not really a ceiling. <laughs> Let's take a look. Um, how do we take a look like this? That is actually a spaceship. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I like demoing it because I think it's kind of funny. But this more serious point is that when you do this creative prototyping, it's OK to use a spaceship as your ceiling. It's OK to use a building as sewer pipes. You do these things early in your project because you don't really know what the project's going to be yet, be like yet. Maybe the, the thing the project ends up being, the, the, the spaceship thing works fine. Only later in your project do you really realize which assets really are important and you want to maybe do some custom modeling for, and which assets just work fine like this. Let me fly around the scene a little bit more, just because I like it so much. Notice that you have these area lights that are shining on the fog. Over here, we have this steam that's coming out. That's a regular Unity particle system. But it's not emitting particles that you can see. It's actually emitting particles that contribute to the fog density there. So the fog is thicker, and that's why the area light is picking it up over there. And as I mentioned, this scene is full of sort of like creative recycling of assets. Like over here, this thing, this, uh, this what is it? Uh, this is also one of the buildings from that sci-fi pack. If I go to the back here. You can see at the back wall, that's all, all the same trick, all sorts of buildings slapped on the side. When I, when I showed this scene to Adam, he went nuts. He immediately wanted to use it as a starting point to do some of his camera work. So let's hear from our chief camera commander, Adam. Cameras are so important for your project for lots of reasons. Here's two. Think of how much television we've watched, how many movies we've watched, hundreds, thousands of hours through a lens. And we have this subconscious understanding of what cameras do, how they move, and what things look like. Think of an animation of a bouncy rubber ball. And if that animation wasn't good, we feel it. We look at it and we say, there's something wrong. Everybody knows how that should animate. And it's the same with cameras. We've never seen a camera instantly start or stop. There's an acceleration and a deceleration there because cameras weigh 50 pounds. So if you do that in your project, people will feel it. Something will feel wrong. The second thing is the power cameras have uh, to impart mood and style and tone. You can have the exact same scene, same animation, same lighting, and you shoot it differently and it will give you a completely different result. The good news is, Cinemachine can help you with both of these things. We've been working on it for a really long time. I'd like to elaborate on one last thing. I'm sure some of you are thinking, yeah, but we're making a game. It's not a movie. You know, we've got this extra dimension of interactivity. We can break the rules and we can try new things and we can innovate. And yes, but knowing the language of where we came from, knowing when to break the rules can be really powerful. Please welcome Adam Myhill. Hi, Lucas. Hey, Adam, what's Thank up? You. Hi, everybody. Show them what you got. So, was it amazing how lighting brought all this stuff together? And, yeah, I know. Yeah, lighting. I, f I first saw this scene, and I'm like, okay, what else can we do? Like, how can we build on this? And how can we use cameras and music to explore different styles and to, like, build on this idea of rapid prototyping, but with, you know, pacing of, of, of lens work and of, and of audio? So in 2017-1, we had Timeline, and that's it right here. And uh, these are Cinemachine clips. And Cinemachine is our procedural camera system. Where, which are Cinemachine clips? These little guys right here. So what I did was, is I put a bunch of cameras down. I did this pretty quickly. This is a few hours. I picked an audio track, and I thought, okay, let's explore a mood. So let's watch it. We'll hit play.
Now something to note here is there's very few keyframes. These are procedural cameras and they work like you're a director and you say how you'd like to compose something and that's compositionally in, in screen space and as things move, the camera will follow it. There's no keyframes on this move. I'm just blending two timeline clips and saying I want to target the guy's face and I'd like it to be here on the screen. And for this super cool little probe thing, not animating the camera, we're just saying look at the probe and compose it this certain way. And for this end sequence, we do this like dreamy pull back into this blurry, depth of fieldy, you know, kind of messy thing. And it was done super quickly. Let me show you. So you, this is just the same scene I was working on. That's you right. You found all these shots in, in, in my little scene. Isn't it cool just how camera and audio can totally change how something feels? So look at this bit. Here's that shot right here. There's even a little bit of procedural noise. So there's actually not animated camera noise. We have a procedural noise system. And I'm going to go ahead and cut to this shot, where it's a little further back, and we crank the depth of field up. So this is a cut. But with the power of timeline, timeline mixes anything that's in two clips. So if I make it overlap, see this overlap section? That's now going to blend the camera transforms, but it's also blending all the post effects. So you can come up with these like crazy ideas super fast. So that's one bit. OK, so that's, we call that what? Moody, right? OK, so I don't know if I like that. You know, we're going to keep this. I'm going to mute it. And then in timeline, you've got these little groups here. And this is a different idea. I always see you work like that with timeline. You just use it like as a scrapbook and have most of them sort of turned off all the time? Yeah, because you can, you can have like little half-baked ideas and just sort of leave them there and mute them. And then you can drag clips around from other tracks so you can assemble all these ideas from, you, know, you can just have like a parts bin of ideas that you assemble on the fly. Right. It's a really fast way of working. Okay, so this is the next one. And uh, the camera's a little more upbeat, the music's a little more upbeat, but the exact same scene, the exact same everything. Now again, there's no camera animation. Can I show you how that works? Ah, that probe looks cool. I know, I love that probe. It's just from the store, right? Yeah. A little bit of animation on that. This one was blending from a, a color to a black and white film grade, but I just left the red out, and just mm -hmm. kept the red channel out. You know, trying out different ideas. I can't believe you found all these shots in this. In, in. So you're working with your creative director, your art lead, and it's like, let's just try this out. Let's just throw some ideas down really quickly. And like you said before, some of these assets we might be getting too close to, some might be too heavy because they're too far away, and that's okay for right now because we're going to come up with a vision for it and then you know, adjust things as we need. So I want to show you that, that opening shot. Look at that's this. That's a good shot. example, actually. Like When I was working with the scene, the characters were far away. Yeah. And the model was you know, good enough, but you changed the whole thing to be all about the cameras. Yeah. That might be a point in the project where I would decide to do some custom no, custom work on that. Right, and to spend some more time on you know, uprising models if they're close to the camera and to not worry about stuff if it's in the background. So look at this. This is a clip. This is a Cinemachine clip. And watch, I'm going to just put on the window guides. This is how it works. It's a procedural camera system. You tell it what to look at, and I'm saying look at the ship. And then you say where you want to compose it on the screen. And no matter how that ship moves, it's going to give us that composition. So here's a new shot. It's a little bit lower. And you can frame this. And I've got a little bit of lag and a little bit of decoupling, so it feels like a weighty camera. And that whole move, there's not a single key frame of animation. Like this little probe, maybe you want to like move it over on this side. You can blend between these compositions. It's such a fast way of working. And what's, what's powerful about it is if you know, an animator comes in over the weekend and changes the animation, or a designer makes things go 10% faster, and you come in the next day, your cameras aren't looking at you know, blue sky, which I've had happen to me a few times. They're, they'll dynamically track what's happening. So 
Isn't it great to see these tools come alive? Uh, I could like I like we were backstage like practicing for the keynote. We were just you know, messing around <laughs> messing around with for hours. I can uh, it's just super cool. Yeah, no, it's great. So, Lucas, thanks for the help with the demo. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah, Hello, everyone. Great. <laughs> so, think think about this. We had an artist, Unity 2017, the asset store, a weekend, and it created that. And I want to build on the topic of asset tools, artist tools, because there's something to talk about, which is Unity and Autodesk. And today, we'd like to announce a collaboration which will create the most streamlined artist tools between Unity and your favorite 3D package like Max and Maya. Yeah. No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And this collaboration makes Unity the first game engine, the first creation engine, to have source code access to the Autodesk FBX file format and its SDK. And what that means is we can create these super fast workflows where artists can use the tools that they love and they can get their stuff into Unity really quickly. And I'm going to show you. Let's take a look. OK, so this goes pretty fast. So we've got a scene. This is in Unity. There's a cube. We want to export it. This is our new exporter. It comes into Maya. We import the model. Now we're in Maya. So you can you know, add detail. In this case, we're just going to put a new model in. We can add a Stingray shader to it. Here we go, drag that on. Obviously, we can you know, model texture, make it look better, things you do in Maya. You drag it. You put it into the Unity export. You hit the one export button. You come back into Unity. Dink. There it is. That's fast. That's fast. <clears throat> There's a knockout punch with this. This is the knockout punch. In Unity, you can put things on it, like collision volumes, box colliders, Unity type things. And when you bring it back into Maya, they're preserved. So you can actually go back into Maya again. It's like a washing machine round trip. You can improve it, tweak some more things, go back into Unity, and all that stuff's still there. So I know for content creators, or people who do this stuff day in, day out, that workflow is going to be, that's a lifesaver. <clears throat>